Hi, everyone. In this video, I will be giving a tutorial on exploratory factor analysis using SPSS. And our example is based in part off of a study uh, that is published at the Plus One website. The article is entitled Three Factor Structure for Epistemic Belief Inventory Across Validation Study. And um, with this article comes the supporting uh, data, actually the raw data file. And we're going to be using just a subsample of the data that was provided. So in the uh, data file that the authors provide, they actually have a single data file uh, with both subsamples in, in there. And I'm, I've basically created a separate data file uh, just with subsample one. So you can access a copy of that data file by following the link that's provided underneath the video description. And I'll also include a link to this article if you want to read more on it. But basically, in the, in the uh, article, uh, the authors uh, collect data on the 28-item epistemic belief inventory from 1,785 Chilean high school students, and they perform an exploratory factor analysis and ultimately decide uh, to stick with a three-factor model. So for our demonstration here, we're not going to be using all 28 items uh, just to kind of keep things a little bit more manageable. We're just going to uh, perform a factor analysis based on the 17 items that the authors actually ended up going with uh, as part of their three-factor model. And so those 17 items are actually shown in Table 2. And just to kind of give you a feeling or a flavor of what uh, the content is, you can see the first item, it says, most things worth knowing are easy to understand. The second one is what is true is a matter of opinion. The third one, students who learn things uh, quickly are the most successful and so forth. So these items are basically kind of reflecting beliefs about the nature of knowledge and knowing. Uh, and also there's beliefs about, you know, the nature of learning and, uh, you know, uh, the nature of uh, kind of intelligence as being fixed versus kind of more malleable, if you will. So that's the content that we will be working with. Okay, so now uh, I've opened up the SPSS data file uh, that we'll be working with. Again, you can find this linked underneath the video description, so you can download it. And um, again, there's 28 items associated with the original measure. These 28 items were administered to the high school students, but we're only going to be analyzing those 17 that were found in that table. So when it comes to carrying out factor analysis, there are multiple steps, uh, and sometimes it can become rather complex. Um, and so I'm kind of, I'm going to kind of distill a few basic steps uh, in this particular conversation. There's other things that that theoretically we might do, like uh, you know checking for outliers or or uh, lack of normality, things like that. We're not going to be going into that. We're just going to be focusing in on the main steps that you might see in the context of carrying out the analysis using this interface uh, or the SPSS interface. So the first thing that we're going to be kind of paying attention to is just the question of whether it makes sense to carry out the factor analysis. So that's really, you know, if you're, you're reading a, a textbook or something uh, where they refer to uh, the question of, you know, is the matrix factorable? Essentially, what we end up doing when we carry out our factor analysis is that we uh, we essentially generate a correlation matrix um, for a set of measured variables. And uh, this particular uh, demonstration right here, our measured variables are the items themselves and the responses, uh, the data on those variables are um, is, is, is what we're analyzing. So we have 17 measured variables or items that we're going to be carrying out the factor analysis on. And we want to know whether or not it makes sense because, you know, in some situations, if the matrix is not factored, what that really reflects is a, you know, a situation where maybe the relationships among the measured variables or items in this case uh, are so small that really what you end up with is, uh, is um, you know, maybe over factoring, uh, having less reliable factors, that sort of thing. And so we don't want to have a situation where we can't really trust our results very well. Uh, other situations might result in uh, inadmissible solutions or um, situations where maybe we just can't carry out the matrix operations. And that would be in those situations where you might have uh, 
high levels of collinearity among uh, your variables or items in this case, or singularity uh, in our in our uh, correlation matrix. So that's kind of the first step in the process. Then we move on to uh, if we decide that we have uh, a matrix that is factorable and that it makes sense to carry out the analysis, then we proceed to determining the number of factors that may account for the intercorrelations among our measured variables. And so in that particular case, um, you know, there are various methods that uh, can be used to make that de determination. By default, SPSS uses the Kaiser criterion. Basically, that's the eigenvalue cutoff rule. Um, in a nutshell, it just means that you retain the number of factors uh, that have an eigenvalue that's greater than one. And typically, that eigenvalue are so you're supposed to apply that eigenvalue cutoff rule to the unreduced correlation matrix. And essentially that's following a principal components analysis. So that's one approach. That's a, actually a pretty lousy approach, uh, but it is the default in SPSS. So I'm going to show you some other alternatives as well, uh, which will include parallel analysis uh, and using the map test and also looking at the scree plot. So that's kind of the second thing. And then when we did make that determination regarding the number of factors, then we proceed on to, um, uh, you know, kind of forcing that final factor solution, forcing extraction of the number of factors that we decide upon, uh, and then rotating those factors for uh, us to be able to interpret the meaning of those factors. So we'll go ahead and get started here by just going up to the analyze button. We'll go down to data reduction. We'll click on factor, uh, which you see right here, and we will select our items for inclusion uh, in our factor analysis. So we have items one through five, CE1 through CE5 uh, right there. Then we have item eight, uh, then we have item nine, and then number 11. Uh, we have item 14 and then 15. Then we have 17, 20, uh, 22, uh, 20, and then 24 through 27. So these are the items that were found in that original table. So next we'll click on descriptives right here. And this is where we get information that is going to bear on the factor ability um, of our correlation matrix. So uh, things that we want to click, we want to be sure to click on univariate descriptive so we can get means, standard deviations, um, and so forth associated with the items. You'll see that with the correlation matrix, we can click on coefficients here. This is going to give us the correlations, the zero order correlations among all of our measured variables. Then We'll click on uh, determinant, KMO, and Bartlett's test of sphericity. And then we'll click on anti-image right here. So we'll click on continue and then on OK. And so now we get our output. Now, a lot of folks, when they are carrying out um, their factor analyses, they tend to kind of do a one-stop shopping of everything. So if you go back and you look through uh, various options. There are other options in here, like if you go under the extraction tab, uh, you've got you know your your method. The default is principal components. Um, this method is oftentimes used, but incorrectly during factor analysis. Um, so we're not really going to be focusing on uh, this particular issue right now. But it, let's say you want to uh, carry out, say, principal axis factoring or maximum likelihood or whatever. You could theoretically click on that. But I, my preference is not to not to do all this and to kind of approach this sequentially uh, because of that eigenvalue cutoff rule, uh, the way that it forces the, the um, a, a particular solution. And it just kind of muddies things up. So my preference is just to leave the other defaults in place and then go back, look at the factor ability question first, and then proceed to the next step. So um, at any rate, we'll uh, go ahead and click out of this. And so we have our descriptive statistics. You'll see we have the mean standard deviations and sample sizes associated with our items. So the sample size is 1,039. So that's actually the first subsample from that original data set. When you scroll down a little bit further, you'll see that we have the zero order correlations among our uh, measured variables or our items. And as you're looking at this, just, you know, it looks like any other correlation matrix uh, along the principal diagonal, you have uh, the ones. So there's our ones uh, that you see right there all the way down. 
Um, I'll just kind of note over here, we'll just kind of highlight that as well. And just keep in mind that when you're looking at this matrix, the values that you see in the lower triangle below the principal diagonal are reproduced above. So they're exactly the same uh, values. Uh, it's just basically um, a reversal of the rows and columns, um, but that's they're the same values. So you only need to look at one uh, triangle, if you will. I tend to still gravitate towards looking at the lower triangle. Um, and so that's where we're at. So what we're looking for uh, as we're uh, examining this correlation matrix, we're looking for um, items or correlations between the items that at least are 0.30 or greater. So we're looking for at least some uh, correlations that are uh, you know at 0.30 or greater. And so as I kind of have gone through this, I've already uh, kind of scanned this and and looked at it. So I've uh, looked. I've found that basically we have about 10 correlations that would meet uh, that minimum criteria. But what you don't want to have is a situation where the correlation matrix where uh, with the correlation matrix where the correlations are all very near zero, because if you have uh, very near zero correlations in your matrix as a, uh, overall, then there's not really uh, any factors that you can extract that would uh, meaningfully account for relationships because there are no relationships to be had. So we want there to be um, at least a reasonable uh, number of correlations that would that would put you in the uh, 0.30 or above range. By the same token, we also don't want to have a situation where we have uh, complete redundancy in the information within the correlation matrix as well. So we don't want to have a situation where uh, we have correlations that are in the 0.90s, um, where essentially you've got high levels of collinearity among the uh, the items, uh, and you certainly don't want to have a, a problems with singularity as well, where basically you would have, uh, you know, one item being sort of a linear function of all the other items. You don't want to have that situation either. Um, in the case where you have um, uh, multicollinearity or singularity, you'll either have situations where uh, maybe you end up with inadmissible values in the case of um, multicollinearity, or you may end up with singularity, which would essentially preclude uh, certain matrix operations when you are carrying out your exploratory factor analysis. So as we kind of looked at this correlation matrix right here, you'll see that that really uh, they're all pretty low correlations, but we do have about 10 correlations that are above 0.30. So that's one uh, thing that you can do in order to screen for the appropriateness of uh, carrying out the factor analysis on our set of items. Another uh, index that we might rely on uh, is the KMO uh uh, measure of sampling adequacy. So this is uh, the the value that we have right here. So if you go back and you think about um, Kaiser's criterion, you know, it basically kind of provides this sort of um, a, a sort of a um, a framework, if you will, for judging the adequacy of the items for inclusion in your factor analysis. So he uses a lot of creative names. So these are the uh, criteria that uh, that he provided. Um, so you can see right here, he's describing uh, KMO values in the 0.90s uh, as marvelous, values in the 0.80s as meritorious, values in the 0.7s as middling, values in the 0.6s as mediocre, values in the 0.5s as miserable, and then less than 0.5 uh, are considered unacceptable. So, like I said, the, the, these are very creative ways of describing uh, the factorability of the matrix. But in general, you know, if you happen to have KMO values that are putting you uh, definitely below 0 0.50, the matrix would be considered unacceptable. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, you have better matrices that you're uh, factoring uh, if you have those KMO values that would put you, um, you know, higher than the the, the 0.50. So going back to our output, then the KMO that we have for our uh, set of items is 0.778, which would put us in that middling range, but uh, based clearly, uh, you know, falling uh, at an acceptable level for carrying out the factor analysis. Then we have uh, Bartlett's test. Next, you'll see that 
uh, in this output, this is basically a test of whether the correlation matrix that we saw above, does that deviate significantly from an identity matrix? And an identity matrix is one uh, that contains ones on the principal diagonal, but zeros on all the off diagonal elements. So zeros in a correlation matrix uh, basically signal a lack of correlation between uh, variables. And so if your uh, correlation matrix does not deviate or uh, is not significantly different from an identity matrix, that's basically the same as saying that there are uh, no associations among your variables, in which case it makes no sense to carry out the factor analysis. So with Bartlett's test right here, this is uh, essentially a chi-square uh, test. And so if we find that this is indicating statistical significance, then we would reject the null hypothesis of an identity matrix and essentially go with the alternative, which is that our correlation matrix is not equivalent to an identity matrix. All that basically means is that our matrix, it's reasonable to carry out the factor analysis because our matrix, we we won't assume that it's uh, coming from a population matrix that's an identity matrix. So uh, in this case, you can see our p-value that's given is uh, less than 0 0.001 right here for our chi-square test. So basically, that's that's a good sign in terms of um, the factorability of our matrix. Also, keep in mind that the, this uh, Bartlett's test is impacted by sample size. And so, you know, we have a really huge sample size um, of 1,039 uh, students who had responded to this particular, uh, within this particular subsample. So you can have very uh, minor um uh, uh, you know, minor discrepancies between the correlation matrix and uh, an identity matrix, but it, but because of the the power due to the large sample size, you might end up kind of rejecting that null. So that's why you know it's it's a useful supplement, but I wouldn't you know uh, put all my uh, weight on that particular index. I would again go back and look at the correlations in the matrix, look at uh, the KMO, the Kaiser Meyer. Meyer Olkin measure of sampling adequacy that we just looked at a second ago. So these are useful for looking at the overall factorability of the scale. Another thing that you might do early on too is to maybe identify potentially problematic items. And so the way that you can do this is to refer to the anti-image correlation matrix. So that's what this next table is. And you'll see it's got anti-image covariances and anti-image correlations. And we're going to focus our attention mainly on uh, this part of our matrix down here where the, we have the anti-image correlations. And in particular, we're looking at the elements in the principal diagonal of this matrix right here. So uh, these values right here are also measures of sampling adequacy. They're KMO values uh, at the item level. And so what we're look so if you go back and you think about Kaiser's uh, descriptions, um, then what we're really uh, shooting for are KMO values for the items that would be uh, greater than 0.5 and um, ideally not in the 0.5s, but at, you know maybe even greater than 0.6, I would say. Um, but nevertheless, as you're looking at all of these values right here, uh, these values are all um, you know, falling in the 0.6s, 0.7s, and some 0.8s. So basically all of these items would be considered reasonable candidates for inclusion in our exploratory factor analysis. And those items, you know, if, if it was the case that we had um, items that are uh, poor uh, for inclusion in the factor analysis, then that we might consider removing that item and then performing the factor analysis on the remaining items. Uh, so that's uh, basically what we have right there. Let me kind of move this over just a bit. There was one additional item down here at the bottom that I didn't uh, highlight. So that's the last one right there. Okay, so at this point, we've uh, you know, we've, we've got some, some good indication of the factorability of the matrix. Uh, one other thing that we want to pay attention to in terms of making that decision about factorability is the determinant of the matrix or the determinant of our correlation matrix. So the determinant is basically like a generalized variance for um, our matrix. And ideally, what we want are values uh, for the determinant that would be uh, greater than 0 0.00001. And so you can find that information if you go back up to the correlation matrix. We've got, it says determinant uh, 
uh, for our matrix is 0.113. Uh, so that's clearly greater than the 0 0.00001. And the thing is, is that if the determinant of the correlation matrix, if it's less than this or, uh, or effectively zero, what that's going to translate into is uh, a situation where when it comes to performing uh, various matrix operations during the, the factor analysis, it's not going to be able to do that. And so you'll end up with uh, sort of the, the program crashing or issuing warning messages and, and so forth. So based on all of this collective information, we look like we're in pretty good shape in terms of carrying out the exploratory factor analysis uh, on the correlations among these items. So we, ne we then move on to step two, which is basically, um, you know, determining or coming up with an estimate of the number of factors that may explain or account for the intercorrelations among our items. And so there are various criteria that are utilized. As I said, you know, basically in, uh, in SPSS, the default criterion is the eigenvalue cutoff rule, basically Kaiser's criterion. And so, uh, you know, when we ran our, initial analysis, by default, it actually goes ahead and does that for us. Uh, so if you scroll down here at this little uh, box that you see uh, right here, uh, you'll see that in the first uh, part of the output right here, you've got initial eigenvalues. And in this column, you've got, these are eigenvalues from a principal components solution. Sorry about the draw drawing right there. Um, in a nutshell, what we've done is we've extracted, um, you know, uh, the number of components that's equal to the number of measured variables, but the components are basically re repackaging the information uh, such that you know each component is is accounting for a certain amount of variation in the original set of our items. And so, with that repackaging, uh, you'll see that basically the components are extracted such that uh, you know the first component will explain the most variation uh, this the next component will explain the next uh, greatest amount of variation the third one the next greatest amount of variation and so forth so the components are extracted uh, such that the eigenvalues which kind of summarizes the variation accounted for uh, uh, are found in sort of a decreasing uh, order. You know, essentially what we, we start with the largest eigenvalue and then we proceed to the smallest eigenvalue from the first component to the 17th component. And uh, the basic idea then is to, um, as I said before, the eigenvalues are basically just kind of summarizing the variation accounted for with the first one accounting for the greatest amount of variation, the last one obviously accounting for the least amount of the total variation. And so the eigenvalue cutoff rule or the Kaiser criterion uh, that's, that's issued by default essentially says, all right, um, we basically are going to retain as many items um, or as many components that explain as much variation as at least one single measured variable. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, you know, as you're looking at this, the first eigenvalue right here is 3.059. The first component is accounting for about the same amount of variation as 3.059 of the original measured variables. The next component accounts for as much variation as about a little bit over two measured variables. And the third one is accounting for another 1.4 um, uh, of the uh, of the original measured variables and so forth. And then if you added up all the eigenvalues in this column right here, it would actually sum up to the, the uh, total number of measured variables, which is 17. And with respect to the eigenvalue cutoff rule, then you basically have our first three uh, of our uh, components. All of those have eigenvalues that are greater than one. And so uh, by default, then it sort of shoots that information over here and says, we're only going to retain uh, uh, those three components. And that's why you see uh, a reproduction of those same eigenvalues over here. So as we think about that particular rule uh, being in place, it's, it's suggesting then 
uh, if we go back and think in terms of how many factors we should retain uh, in our factor analysis or ultimately should extract in our final factor analysis, uh, based on this rule, we would it would suggest that we retain or extract uh, three factors. OK, but now the Kaiser criterion is a really crummy rule. Uh, historically, it is uh, tended towards over factoring and um, it's just generally not regarded very favorably uh, nowadays. Um, in particular, there are other uh, procedures that do a better job of determining the number of factors. So some of those include uh, the use of parallel analysis. Uh, also, there is uh, the use of the MAP test, and, and there are some other uh, options that are available through other programs, um, but that are not necessarily available uh, through SPSS, which is a little bit frustrating because it seems like SPSS would uh, do a better job of updating, um, you know, uh, according to what is considered best practice. So right now, it's still stuck in um, not so good practice. I will also say while I'm here, I'll go ahead and show you one other um, approach to determining a number of factors. Uh, we can also look at the scree test. If we go back under factor right here and click on extraction, if we leave this all um, the same, if, we, if I click on scree plot right here, then it will also give us a plot of the eigenvalues that you saw in the first column from that table against the component numbers. So uh, basically all you have to do to obtain that is click on scree plot right here. So just keep in mind though that the eigenvalues are based off of um, essentially a PCA solution and whether you change the method to a more common factor analytic approach or not, the scree plot will still be reflecting that PCA uh, solution. Just to show you too that default I was telling you about, this is where it says right here, it says extract and it says based on eigenvalues greater than one, that's the default right there. And so what it does is that even if we made other selections in terms of methods for extraction using more of a standard common factor analytic approach, uh, it's still going to use this rule to make that final determination of the number of factors uh, to extract. And so it kind of steals the decision making away from uh, the analyst if you're not careful. So what we're going to do is uh, consider the scree plot in addition to what we just looked at with the, the uh, Kaiser criterion. And then we're going to move on to two better approaches for determining the number of factors, which are uh, parallel analysis and the MAP test. So we'll go ahead and click on continue right here and then on OK. Just taking a look now, when we scroll down, we have our scree plot. And as you're looking at this, just kind of think about the side of a mountain. OK, so you have the main slope, if you will, uh, and then you have sort of the rubble at the base of the mountain. So as you're looking at the scree plot, I'll kind of move it up here just a bit. Uh, the eigenvalues that we had up here in this table are being plotted. So these are the eigenvalues that are being plotted uh, in this um, in this plot right here. So the first eigenvalue of 3.059, that's this value right here. The second one, the 2.042 is this one. Then the third one is 1.427, which is this one, uh, and then so forth. And so you'll see that really what you're looking for in this plot is kind of an elbow. Um, and so the elbow basically marks the start of trivial, more trivial factors. So you could think of it as, you know, these three factors right here are, um, you know, apparently they're not, uh, we would not consider those to be trivial, but major more, but more major factors. And then here's our elbow right here. And essentially, then we see a trailing off of those eigenvalues as we move uh, from, uh, you know, component four through component 17. And so that would be essentially our break point. And we would retain uh, those factors with an eigenvalue or those we would basically retain the three major factors that we see in this plot. Uh, this is a great uh, visualization tool. It helps to kind of better understand um, what, you know, uh, you know, the difference between major and minor factors. As you can see right here, it looks pretty clean. Uh, one of the downsides of the scree plot is its subjectivity. Um, even though we have a fairly clean picture right here of uh, supporting a three-factor um, approach or a three-factor uh, solution, if you will, that we would want to um, uh, force, 
uh, in some scree plots, things can become a lot more ambiguous. Sometimes it looks like there are multiple elbows, if you will, multiple breaks, and it can become a lot uh, trickier to interpret. So fortunately, in this case, it's uh, pretty straightforward. But the downside of the scree plot is its subjectivity, and sometimes it can become uh, much more tricky to, in order to um, determine the number of factors. Okay, so now we're going to move on to parallel analysis and the map test. So underneath the video description, you'll find a link to a syntax file that I've kind of put together based on uh, two separate syntax files that uh, was created by Brian O'Connor um, and is associated with his 2000 article um, in uh, behavioral research methods. But uh, what I wanted to do, because, uh, you know, basically he had two separate files, one for parallel analysis, one for map test, uh, I wanted to kind of put it all in one place uh, where you might be able to uh, just kind of generate all this output at the same time. So if you follow that link underneath the video description and open it, open up um, the syntax file as we have our data opened up, uh, this is basically what it looks like right here. So uh, the first part of the file really focuses in on the parallel analysis. The second part is on the um, using the map test. And so really all you have to do, there's only you know a couple of things that you have to do in order to use this particular file. And I will encourage you, um, really my suggestion is to not leave open multiple uh, SPSS data files when you're using this particular um, syntax. OK, so I, my suggestion is leave open only the one file that you want to be um, analyzing. So just because uh, sometimes if you're not careful, if you have multiple files open, I, I think there might be some issues that can emerge. So the first thing that you need to do is to kind of make your specifications with respect to parallel analysis. And with parallel analysis, the idea is um, you know, when you're looking at this, when we kind of go back and we think about that scree plot and we think about the eigenvalues that were generated during our initial PCA, that's that's based on the actual raw data. And what parallel analysis is kind of doing is trying to account for possible sampling error that might also factor into the computations of, of, uh, of eigenvalues. And so that's kind of where Kaiser's criterion kind of falls down. So the, uh, the idea with uh, parallel analysis is to generate simulated uh, eigenvalues and then compare that uh, compare those eigenvalues against our uh, the eigenvalues from our data and then uh, make our determination of the number of factors based on the number of uh, eigenvalues from our data that exceed the number of simulated eigenvalues so what we're going to do is go to line 15 right here um, and really we're going to leave everything up to this point the same do not touch anything else the only thing that we need to do is following the equal sign is to include the items that we are that uh, are referred to the items in our open uh, SPSS data file uh, that we are subjecting to factor analysis. So you'll see right here, I already had like C1 to C5, but basically, um, you know, we can type in CE1 uh, CE2, CE3, those are three of the items, all the way to CE5. Uh, if you want to make life a little bit easier, because these uh, these variables are all adjacent to each other in the data file, you can just say CE1 to CE5. And then we have um, CE8, CE9, CE11, CE14, CE15, CE17, CE20, CE22, and then CE24 to CE27. So that's all you have to do, okay? And make sure that th that period is at the end of the line. So um, if it's not there, uh, you may have problems. So I'm gonna actually copy all of this um, rather than typing it in later, but basically all I need to do now is to scroll down, uh, leave everything else the same. Do not touch any of the other uh, syntax. Go all the way down to the end right here, and you can see that uh, we've got our VAR um, set equal to, and then we're just going to put those uh, names in here as well. So this is, uh, you know, the specifications for the map test. So we have our variables in both of these sections. The other thing I will draw your attention to as well 
when you are performing the fact the uh, parallel analysis, you need you need to determine the number of simulated data sets that uh, you're going to be working with. So by default, I have 1,000 right here. Um, so uh, just basically is compute end data set set equal to 1,000. In the original syntax, he had, I believe he might've had a 100 or something like that. I just added a zero to make it 1,000. You have right here, uh, desired percentile. The default is uh, 95. Uh, basically what happens during the context in the context of parallel analysis is that simulated uh, data sets where essentially the the relationships among the variables are all zero um, we generate simulated data sets like in this case it would be 1000 of those simulated data sets uh, from those you would have correlation matrices that would be uh, generated from those correlation matrices the eigenvalues uh, would be computed and then uh, if you, with this particular setting right here it would take the 95th percentile of the eigenvalues uh, for all of the components that are uh, extracted from those and then that would be the criteria that you're using um, in comparison to the eigenvalues from your data uh, there uh, the other approach um, is to take the mean of the those eigenvalues and so that's also provided in the output by default the down here where it says um you have actually a couple of options you've got uh, a setting of one or two for uh the first one being principal components analysis two for common factor analysis basically principal access common factor analysis so you've got this uh compute kind equals the the uh default setting is one for principal components analysis this is actually the historical uh, way that you uh, would tend to do this, but you've got other authors, uh, particularly like Humphreys and some of those uh, authors who suggested we shouldn't be uh, carrying out the parallel analysis on uh, using principal components analysis. We ought to be carrying out the analysis using a reduced correlation matrix. Um, uh, such as in the context of principal axis uh, factor analysis. Um, the historical, you know, the tendency historically has been to rely on principal components analysis. It does tend to, to tend to behave pretty well in terms of determining the number of factors, um, and so we're just going to stick with that particular approach. Um, if you uh, if you disagree with that approach, that's perfectly fine. You can still, if you wanted to, you can come down here and type a two in. Uh, it's it's very simple. Uh, then you've got uh, down below, you've got just you know whether you want to simulate data from. Um, you know, a normal distribution, or if you want to use per permutations of the raw data set, we're just going to stick with the one option, which is uh, for normally distributed random data uh, generation. So at this point, we've made our specifications. I'm going to right click and then select run all. So when I click on run all, I get my output. So you'll see that first off, we have the results related to our parallel analysis. And so as you're looking at this, you can see these are the eigenvalues right here, the raw data eigenvalues. Those are from the initial PCA or principal components analysis. Uh, basically, it's just the extraction of components from an unreduced correlation matrix. So then we've got uh, this column here contains the mean eigenvalues from those simulated correlation matrices and the 95th percentile. So depending on which criteria you want to use, you could use either the means column or the, the, the 95th percentile uh, column. That's fine. Uh, the basic idea, though, is uh, that you are making this comparison between the random eigenvalues in either of these two columns and the eigenvalues from your raw data. And you want to maintain the number of factors uh, that ex uh, with eigenvalues that exceed the randomly generated eigenvalues. So I'm going to go with the 95th percentile uh, column right here. I'm going to use these as my basis. And so in this particular case, you can see that the, the random eigenvalue for the first component is um, less than the, uh, the uh, eigenvalue for the first component uh, from our data. Then the eigenvalue from our second component is also less than the eigenvalue from our uh, raw data. Then the eigenvalue for the um, third component, uh, the randomly generated eigenvalue is less than that for uh, the data for our third component. And then you'll notice uh, kind of a reversal here. So the eigenvalue, the random eigenvalue uh, 
1.1406 is now greater than the eigenvalue from our raw data, which is 0.997997. Uh, and so at this point, the random eigenvalues are now going to start to exceed the eigenvalues from our raw data. So basically what that uh, conveys to us is that we do not want to retain any more uh, factors than three. So we're going to stick with three factors and we're just going to kind of, um, you know, ignore all of the other factors. So in this case right here, we, this would suggest a three factor solution. So then if we scroll down a little bit further, you'll see that we've got uh, the map test. So the basic idea behind the map test is that um, we're essentially computing uh, the average of squared partial correlations for different, uh, based on different component models. And then we are taking the, the, uh, the, uh, the smallest average of those squared partial correlations um, as sort of the determining factor when it comes to making a decision about which which number of factors we should uh, stick with. So, the, you know, basically with the first um, the first um, part of our output right here, you'll see it says zero for this is basically this column is kind of a component number, if you will. And you'll see the zero. Basically, there's no components that are being extracted. All you're doing in this case is taking the uh, the average of the squared zero order correlations among the variables. And you'll see right here that it's point uh, zero two four seven. Then there is the extraction of a single component. And what we're doing in this case is we are computing the correlations among all of our items. Uh, after but controlling for that first principal component. So we're sort of uh, parceling that principal component out of the associations among the original set of items. And then we're squaring those correlations and then uh, and then averaging them. And so th that's what this value is right here. And so all subsequent um, values in that second column basically are reflecting the partialing of more and more components uh, from those associations. And so what we're looking for in the second column right here is the smallest map value. And so it just so happens that um, you'll see right here that if we added, if we kind of um, partialed two components, you'll see that this value actually starts to increase again. So you'll see it's decreasing um, right here and then increasing as we move from uh, a one component model to a comp two component model. And so with that, uh, basically that would suggest uh, retaining uh, a one component model. And so that's why down here it just says the number of components according to our map test is one. So now you can see that, you know, kind of looking at the overall set of our uh, information, the uh, Kaiser criterion suggested a three factor solution. Uh, the scree plot uh, gave us a good indication of a three factor solution would be a good idea. Uh, the uh, more well established uh, technique of parallel analysis uh, also suggests a three factor uh, solution, but our map test is actually suggesting a one factor model. So there, you know, when it comes to thinking about these different um, approaches to determining a number of factors, keep in mind that they don't all have to agree. They can disagree. And so then you have to kind of uh, make other, you know, have other considerations when it comes to um, uh, determining the number of factors. One other approach that you could you could use is to carry out then your factor analysis based on the uh, the number of factors that are suggested by these different uh, procedures, and then kind of look to see which which of those uh, is most interpretable. Basically, kind of force the factor uh, solution associated with a get with with some of these different procedures, rotate the uh, factors, and then interpret them, and then kind of make that determination based on uh, you know the number of items per factor, and also uh, the interpretability of those factors. But for this particular purpose right here, I'm, I'm familiar enough with the, the literature on uh, the EBI that I'm pretty comfortable with sticking with a three-factor solution um, rather than a one-factor solution because the evidence in this, this particular uh, area uh, has been that uh, uh, epistemological and learning beliefs and so forth are multi-dimensional, not unidimensional. So at this point, we're going to then transition to 
uh, carrying out the final factor analysis. So we'll go to analyze, we'll go down to dimension reduction and factor right here. We'll click on extraction. And so with respect to the method, the default is principal components analysis. And uh, there is a long history of debate in the literature on whether it's reasonable to use principal components analysis or should we use um, an, a, a, a common factor analytic approach. So the basic idea with principal components analysis is that you are extracting uh, components out of the correlation matrix with that correlation matrix being a, you know, a, a, a full unreduced correlation matrix. OK, so that matrix basically contains once on the principal diagonal. It's our standard correlation matrix. Uh, in the context of common factor analysis, uh, we we basically are uh, oftentimes substituting uh, estimates of communality into the the uh, correlation matrix kind of a, a, as an initial starting point and then sort of iterating through uh, various solutions until we are iterating through several cycles to come up with final estimates of communality. And, um, and the idea is to capture that common variation. That's what we're really interested in factoring. Principal components analysis is basically an analysis of all the total variation in a set of measured variables, whereas um, common factor analytic approaches are, are focused on analyzing the common variation among those, um, those variables. So as I said, there's a long debate uh, in the literature about whether it's reasonable to use principal components analysis or a common factor analytic approach. I tend to go with the common factor analytic approach as uh, a stronger uh, basis uh, for uh, this type of analysis. So I'm gonna select one of those other methods and the method that we're going to stick with in this video is uh, principal axis factoring. So uh, we'll click on that. And then because we've determined that we want three factors, I'm going to select fixed number of factors. Factors to extract uh, is equal to three. So we're going to force a three factor solution. Now, as I said before, you know, if we had left the default right here on the eigenvalue cutoff rule, the program would have uh, essentially ended up uh, going with a three factor solution uh, and then using the principal axis factoring uh, with with um, determining the three factors. But, you know, just because the Kaiser criterion says it's one thing, you know, other approaches to determining the number of factors can can uh, suggest other numbers of factors. So I'm kind of trying to give you a little bit more of a realistic take of, you know, what to do if you decide on a different um, number of factors than what the program is going to give you based on that Kaiser criterion. So we're going to uh, select this right here. Again, we typed in three and we'll click on uh, continue. So we're forcing a three factor solution. We'll click on rotation and then uh, we've got uh, you know, various options. So the basic idea behind rotation is this, that when we extract our factors, um, you know, at that point, they are unrotated. And basically, when it comes to interpreting the factor pattern matrices and so forth, they can uh, yield uh, really not very much clarity when it comes to kind of naming and defining those factors. So oftentimes, or really most of the time, uh, researchers will, will end up uh, performing a rotation uh, in factor space in order to uh, provide meaning or naming uh, or definition to the factors. So there are two general classes of rotation that one might use. One is called orthogonal rotation. The other is called oblique rotation. So with or orthogonal rotation, basically uh, the idea is to uh, maintain the original orthogonality of the factors, but just perform a rotation in space. And so, you know, when, when it comes to the initial extraction, like our three factors, when we extract them, they are going to, um, they're basically going to be orthogonal to each other. In other words, each factor is going to account for, um, you know, additive amounts of, of information or variation in the original set of measured variables. So if we perform that orthogonal rotation, it's going to do, it's going to maintain that, that property. Um, and so a common, you know, probably the most common uh, uh, orthogonal rotation that people utilize is Veramax rotation, which is this one right here. Now, another 
the other class of rotations is oblique rotation. So the idea behind that is that, you know, when it comes to real, you know, real life, so to speak, um, you know, things are not usually uh, completely uncorrelated with each other. Uh, and so what we might want to do is to relax that constraint of orthogonality and allow the factors to correlate, which might be more uh, a realistic uh, assumption in terms of the relationships um, involving our factors. So oblique rotation basically relaxes that assumption, allows for a correlation to become manifest um, if, there, if there is one. And so uh, the approach in that particular case, we want, you know, a very common approach uh, is to use like the ob uh, direct Obelman or Promax. We're going to stick uh, in this particular demonstration on using Promax rotation. So as I proceed, I'm going to really just kind of show both of these uh, approaches to rotation just to kind of uh, let you see the differences uh, in, in the output. So we'll start off actually with Promax rotation and we'll click on um, continue and then on OK to generate our output. So all of the other stuff that we had actually, like the KMO, Bartlett's test, the um, anti-image correlations and so forth, all those uh, are exactly the same as what we had before. Now, in terms of uh, the first table right here, you'll see it says communalities. And this is where I was talking about with respect to the reduced correlation matrix. So uh, you'll see right here this initial column this is basically just a, a, an initial set of estimates of communality that are placed into the principal diagonal of the uh, of the correlation matrix that's being subjected to factor analysis. And so uh, these estimates are, in a nutshell, you can easily compute them uh, just if you take take each item and regress it on the remaining items, the R square value uh, in that particular case is the squared multiple correlation. And that is the value that you see for each of these. So that's literally where it starts. And then the extraction commonalities, these are final estimates of the uh, variation in each of the items that's accounted for by the set of extracted factors. So in other words, You'll see right here for the first item, CE1, the value is 0 0.207. So we would say then that uh, the, the, the three factors that we have extracted accounts collectively for about roughly 21% of the variation in CE1. The second, um, I, the second communality right here uh, is 0 0.309. And so we can say then that the set of our factors is accounting for roughly 31% of the variation in CE2. You'll see down here for CE4, the set of variables account for roughly 41% uh, of the variation in CE4 and so forth. So that's the way that you can think about uh, the meaning behind the communalities. It's essentially reflecting the proportion of variation in each of our indicators that's accounted for by the full set of factors that have been extracted. We'll scroll down a little bit further. And so we have our table and just kind of keep in mind that again, all of this information right over here is exactly the same as what we had before when we ran the principal components analysis. Notice that the language has changed a little bit. They're using the term factor here, um, but you know, in a nutshell, uh, the eigenvalues that you see in this column right here, these are all essentially from a principal components analysis. And uh, so just kind of keep that in mind as, as, as we go through this. One other thing I do want to mention too is that these eigenvalues, if we divide the eigenvalues by the total uh, number of measured variables, then that's what gets us a proportion. If we multiply that proportion by 100%, that's the percentage of variance accounted for by each, in this case, each of these components right here. So, you know, simply put, if we kind of go back over here, if I divide three, 0 0.059 by the total number of items, which was 17, uh, and multiply that by 100%, we would say then that that first component was accounting for almost 18% of the variation in the items. Uh, cumulatively, obviously, that's going to be the same. For the second component, 2.042, if I divide that by the number of items and multiply by 100%, you can say then that uh, fat, the component two is accounting for an additional 12% of the variation. So cumulatively, factors one and two account for roughly 30 point, or basically 30% of the variation and so forth. 
So when we look over here in the extraction sum of squared loadings, basically the eigenvalues that you see right here are based off of the final um, extracted solution. So using the principal axis factoring method. And so when it comes to reporting uh, the um, the eigenvalues and percentage of variance accounted for, uh, you'll want to make sure that you're reporting uh, information over here in these columns right here, as opposed to what we had in the initial eigenvalues. So, uh, you know, basically the first eigenvalue that you see right here, just take this number, divide by the uh, 17, the number of variables, uh, multiply by 100%. You can see then that factor one accounts for about 13.7% uh, of the variation in the items. Factor two, the 1.351 accounts for about 7.946% uh, 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 of the variation or basically roughly 8% of the variation and so forth. And we'll actually, we'll go ahead and uh, note then that last um, factor, factor three accounts, uh, the eigenvalue is 0 0.703 and it accounts for about 4% of the variation. So cumulatively, uh, the fact the three factors are accounting for about 25, roughly 26 percent of the variation in our uh, indicator variables, our measured variables. So then you'll see over here we've got the rotated sums of squared loadings. These are basically uh, also, um, you know, kind of eigenvalues, if you will. Uh, but in this particular case, you'll notice that that the percentages that we saw pre prior to rotation, all of this is up here. This is pre rotation. OK, so basically, uh, you know, the the factors are accounting for um, uh, distinct percentages of variation in the original set of measured variables. But then post rotation over here, I'll just call this post rotation. Um, what we have, uh, the factors are accounting for variation, but because the factors are allowed to correlate, remember, we uh, Promax rotation is an oblique rotation. It allows for correlations among the factors. Then we can't talk about the factors as accounting for uh, additive pr uh, proportions of variation in the um, original set of measured variables. And so that's the reason why we don't have the additional columns for percentage of variance and cumulative percentage of variance that we had previously. So when you're reporting and you're you're running the analysis using um, you know uh, Promax rotation, you know you'll you'll want to make sure that you re, uh, report on the pre-rotation eigenvalues, percentage of variance accounted for, and so forth, and then the post-rotated uh, post-rotation uh, sums of squared loadings that you see here. But you're not you're still accounting for com, uh, as a as a set. You're still accounting for the same total amount of variation, but you have a redistribution of the variation uh, uh, accounted for by the factors. And uh, also because the factors are correlated, we can't talk about each factor as accounting for a distinct uh, amount of variation. So next we'll scroll down. There's our screen plot again. You'll see that here we have our factor uh, pattern matrix right here. And so this is it right here. And basically the values in this matrix, these are zero order correlations between each item and the three extracted factors. So the correlation between CE1 and factor one is 0 0.095. The correlation between fact, uh, CE1 and factor two is 0 0.33. And then the correlation between CE1 and factor three is 0 0.299. Now, the idea uh, following uh, or during your analysis is, is that you not only want to extract the factors, but you want to give meaning to them and give, you know, name them or define them or, you know, give some kind of, um, uh, uh, some kind of clarity as to what is being measured by the set of your, um, your items. And so that's where you use uh, factor loading matrices in order to do that. Now, the factor matrix that you see right here, this is actually reflecting, or this is, uh, th these loadings are reflecting the fact that the factors have not been rotated. So in other words, this factor matrix that you see right here uh, is basically uh, corresponding to the information that you see in this part of our table, basically pre-rotation. So because of that, they're oftentimes not going to be particularly useful when it comes to interpretation 
of those factors based on the loadings that are presented within. So what we want to do is to uh, hang our interpretation on um, uh, rotated loading. So the way that we can do that is we'll scroll down a little bit further and we'll go to the pattern matrix that you see right here. So in this particular case, this matrix is following rotation. Okay, so in other words, uh, I'll just say following rotation. Okay, and so as you're looking at this, just kind of keep in mind that as you know, when we rotated uh, the uh, the um, the previous loadings or the previous factors, if you will, then the loadings in this particular matrix um, reflect the association between each measured variable and the factors. Still the same idea, but now because we performed an oblique rotation. Uh, essentially through our uh, Promax rotation, uh, now the factors are correlated. So then when it comes to talking about the relationships or looking at the loadings and then talking about the relationships between the items and the factors, we can't talk about them using the language that we discussed above, which was uh, in terms of the zero order correlations. Here, the loadings are more analogous to standardized regression coefficients. So I'll just say uh, analogous to standardized regression coefficients. Okay, so, you know, think about it this way, that each item, uh, the variation in each item, we're trying to account for that variation uh, by the respective factors. So if you think about it in uh, regression terminology, think about the three factors as um, as predictor variables in a regression where you are predicting variation in the individual items. And because the uh, factors are intercorrelated with each other, then the regression, uh, the standardized regression uh, coefficients um, are, are essentially kind of uh, controlling for the correlations um, involving the, the, other, um, the other predictors in the model. So in other words, as we're looking at uh, this first loading right here, 0 0.032 for CE1 on factor one, um, think about it this way, that basically that's the relationship between the first factor and CE1 controlling for the other two factors. Then we've got the 0 0.027 right here. That's the relationship between CE1 and factor two controlling for, you know, factors one and, and three. And then we've got uh, the loading here, 0.445. That's the relationship between CE1 and factor three controlling for factors one and two. So that's the basic idea um, as we're looking at this particular matrix, and that's why I say they're analogous to standardized regression coefficients. Now, what we want to do is we want to uh, give naming or meaning to each of the factors. And so the way that we do that is we look at uh, which items are most associated with those factors. Now, ideally, what we want is a situation where we have the items are uh, near zero on on uh, most of the factors, and then you know non-trivially loaded onto a single factor. That's kind of the ideal, and so that's part of the purpose too of, of performing the rotation. So what we typically do then is we we make a sort of a we come up with a criteria for deciding on um, you know whether an item is loading non-trivially onto a factor. So that is re what is referred to as a loading criteria. Okay. And um, you know various authors have provided you know various rules of thumb about what constitutes a non-trivial loading. Uh, so you'll see in the literature some folks uh, suggest a, a minimum loading of you know, let's say uh, 0 0.30 uh, in absolute value. Uh, some you might see 0.32 uh, as a minimum loading. Some uh, would suggest 0 0.40 uh, as a minimum loading criteria. I know that's in the, the Pittock and Stevens book. That's mostly where I kind of land. Uh, but, you know, others, other authors would suggest uh, maybe these other rules of thumb. So in general, the loading criteria uh, that are proposed in the literature, you'll see them kind of ranging, but you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.3 and 0.4. But the basic idea is to identify which of the items um, 
you know, uh, or which of the which of the items are associated with a factor uh, at some minimum threshold. So for this particular vid, uh, uh, demonstration right here, I, I, I am actually going to just stick with a 0 0.30 uh, as the minimum criteria. So if you look at the pattern matrix right here, you'll see that it meet, uh, CE1 meets the minimum loading criteria on factor three, and obviously it's well below that criteria on factors one and two. Then you've got for CE2, uh, it's meeting the minimum loading criteria on factor three. If we just kind of, uh, and, and, but not on factors one and two. Um, if we just kind of continue on down using the minimum loading criteria, we'll just stick with three right now. You'll see that uh, item 11, meets that minimum loading criteria, uh, as well as item 17, uh, and then item uh, 22 right here. So these are the items that we might use to define or name uh, factor three. When it comes to uh, factor uh, one, we'll just kind of go ahead and go back over here. We'll go down uh, column one, you'll see item three uh, loads onto that particular factor. Then we've got item uh, five and item eight and also item nine, all three of those meet that minimum loading criteria. Then you've got item 14 and item 15 right here, uh, and then item 20 right here, and then item 24 and item 27 right there. So those items would be used. Uh, we just are essentially going to look for thematic content in the items that helps us to give uh, a name or representation to that factor. Then for factor two, we'll scroll down, we'll kind of look down here. We've got uh, item four right there. When we kind of keep going down, you'll see that it, it actually turns out there's only three items that um, meet that minimum loading criteria on that factor. So, and keep in mind too, that when it comes to, uh, you know, determining or naming or giving representation to the factors, we need to have at least three indicators on those factors. If you happen to have two indicators, um, that's not really, um, uh, that's not, not that's not something we want to have happen. Uh, we need to have at least three indicators. So, you know, if it happens to be the case where you end up, you know, performing an analysis and you get some factors that maybe have one or two indicators, that could be a symptom of over uh, uh, of over factoring, and you might need to adopt um, a factor model that has fewer factors. So, and if it happens to be the case where you have really uh, all of the items sort of loading very closely together, you know, loading onto a single factor, and they should be sort of breaking out different factors, that would be a symptom of possible under factoring. So, in this particular case, these are the items that seem to meet the minimum loading criteria. You'll also see that for each of those items that are loading onto a single factor, that, you know, they exhibit lower loadings on the other factors. And that's ideally what we would have. That's that, you know, that's the best case scenario. In some situations, though, when you carry out your analysis, you might have an item that loads um, that meets the minimum loading criteria across multiple factors, maybe two or, or perhaps even more factors. But and on top of that, there's not a much distinction uh, or, or, um, or difference in the, in the loadings themselves. In that particular case, um, in terms of scale development, uh, that item might not necessarily be a useful thing to include in your final scale because it's not doing a good job of discriminating between the different factors. So uh, that is something to kind of keep in mind uh, if you are uh, you know, working on developing a scale for use. So at any rate, we've we've sort of identified those items that meet the minimum loading criteria. So now we need to name them and give them some meaning. So this is a table that I created just with the item content and also uh, the loadings that we saw in our um, our uh, factor pattern matrix, our rotated factor pattern matrix. So as you're looking at this. You know, we have to think about, you know, what I have right here, the items in bold are the ones that are meeting that loading criteria. So um, you'll see that the first item, it says most things worth knowing are easy to understand. Uh, the second item is what is true is a matter of opinion. And that's actually a, a, a negatively worded item in that scale. So if you're responding to the item prior to reversal, uh, basically that would indicate more of a complex view of knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, basically sort of a view of knowledge as 
uh, less certain, if you will. Uh, so if we reverse code it, it's actually reflecting sort of more of a naive belief uh, in certain knowledge. And the first item, most things knowing are uh, easy to understand. That's also reflecting that sort of naive belief. So uh, you can see that both of these items are, are loading here. Uh, uh, positively, you'll see we've got uh, the best ideas are often the most simple. Then you've got things are simpler than most professors would have you believe. Uh, then uh, item 22, that's another reverse coded item that you see right there. So after reversal, which is what, what's already been done, uh, then you know a higher value on that reversed uh, item would reflect more of a naive belief. So in the end, the content of those items uh, are reflecting sort of a belief in simple and certain knowledge, the belief that knowledge is simple and, again, certain. Uh, if we look in terms of factor two right here, um, you'll see that we've got people should always obey the law. Then we have uh, the items, when someone in authority tells me what to do, I usually do it. And then we also have people shouldn't question authority. So that's really kind of reflecting the belief uh, that uh, you know, knowledge and really the way that we should do things comes from um, authority figures. That's, you know, that's the, the basic uh, belief that's represented right there. Then if we look at factor one, we've got students who learn things quickly are the most successful. We've got people's intellectual birth of uh, uh, potential is fixed at birth. Uh, really smart students don't have to work uh, as hard in school. And also if a person tries to understand a problem, they will most likely end up being confused. Then we have how well do you, how well you do in school depends on how smart you are. So again, you know some of these items are reflecting kind of the belief that uh, intelligence uh, is fixed um, and uh, something that's not malleable. And then also some of these items are belief, are reflecting sort of a, a belief that learning should be quick and not at all, and maybe even a blend of sort of you know smarter people are going to learn faster that sort of idea. So uh, at any rate, all of these items right here are loaded on that first uh, factor. So we're going to call this uh, fixed ability and quick learning or the belief in fixed ability and quick learning. So that's the basic uh, idea that we're uh, adopting here. We're using the loadings to help give meaning or representation to the, fact, uh, to the factors that we have extracted. So now what we're gonna do is move to uh, the next part of our output and we'll scroll down and you'll see we have a structure matrix. So this matrix is basically just containing correlations, the zero order correlations between each item and each factor. Um, now, unlike the pattern matrix that we saw above, this matrix does not control for the intercorrelations between uh, uh, the items and the fact, uh, the uh, intercorrelations among the factors. And so, um, so that's really kind of an important distinction uh, between these two matrices. And so sometimes you'll find that there will be some 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 differences between these two matrices. Um, but keep in mind, the main naming and, and description of, of the factors really should pivot off of the pattern matrix. Uh, but the structure matrix can still offer some additional information that you might find useful. Then finally, when we look at the very bottom, we've got the, the uh, factor correlation matrix right here. So you'll see, uh, you know, if we were to extract the uh, extract our factors and compute factor scores, this these would be the correlations among the factor scores. So you'll see factor one is correlated with factor two at about 0.144, with factor three at about 0 0.009. So largely, the belief in uh, fixed ability and quick learning doesn't seem to be very highly correlated <clears throat> with the belief in omniscient authority or simple and certain knowledge. But when we look at the correlation between omniscient authority and uh, the simple and certain knowledge, you see a positive correlation right there, a modest positive correlation between those two factors at the correlation being about 0 0.308. Okay, so now let's go ahead and run our analysis. And in this case though, we're gonna use Verimax rotation. So I'll go back, rerun the analysis, Go back to extraction. We, actually, all that's going to be exactly the same as before. We'll go to rotation and click on Verimax and then continue and then on OK. So all of this stuff 
that we had before is exactly the same. The communalities, the initial and extraction will be exactly the same. Uh, if we look in our uh, table uh, containing the breakdown of factors, the pre-rotation eigenvalues, pre-rotation, sorry about that, the pre-rotation eigenvalues uh, and variance accounted for is all going to be the same. Uh, now you'll see, though, that we have post-rotation, I'll just say post-rotation, um, eigenvalues and percentage of variance accounted for. And remember what I said earlier, that uh, basically uh, the, the pre-rotated uh, factors are, count, are going to account for additive amounts of information in the original set of measured variables. Um, if we use an ob uh, oblique rotation, we can't talk about it that way in terms of the rotated factors. But uh, if we have an, an orthogonal rotation, we maintain that assumption that the factors are uncorrelated. And so now you've got uh, the eigenvalues right here uh, post-rotation for the uh, Varimax rotated factors. Uh, and then you've got the percentage of variance accounted for and the cumulative percentage of variance accounted for here. And notice, you know, obviously that you know, the pre-rotation and post-rotation cumulative percentage of variance accounted for is um, is going to be exactly the same. But, uh, you know, when you perform the rotation, the variance accounted for by each of the factors will also uh, change as well. And so that's why the eigenvalues and percentage of variance accounted for uh, pre-rotation to post-rotation look a little bit different. Um, but be sure when you are reporting uh, on, on your factor analysis results, be sure to report on the eigenvalues, percentage of variance accounted for pre-rotation and then also post-rotation um, so that you, you're giving enough information for the reader to, to you know, really better understand um, you know, the differences uh, between pre and post-rotation results. So we'll scroll down. We've got our uh, factor matrix right here. The, um, it's going to be exactly the same as what we had before because this is pre-rotation. When we scroll down a little bit further, now we've got um, essentially the 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 uh, factor pattern kind of structure matrix, if you will, which is given right here. And this is the matrix that we use to interpret um, our factors. So if we still stick with the same loading criteria that we had before, you're actually going to find that um, the, the factors are going to be exactly the same in terms of their names. Uh, probably the one difference that you're going to see is this this loading right here uh, is 0.296. So, you know, if you don't round it off, then that, that particular item 17 would not be included uh, in defining that factor uh, as we had seen before. So it just kind of depends on, you know, how, how closely you want to round. Um, but basically that's, that's really all there is to it in terms of interpreting that matrix. Essentially, you know, when, when you're dealing with, um, as we saw before, when we used oblique rotation, we saw we had a factor pattern matrix that accounted for the interrelations or intercorrelations among uh, the factors. And so the loadings were essentially the relationship between each item and the factors controlling for the other factors. Uh, the structure matrix was the zero order correlations between the items and the factors. Uh, in this case, because the factor the factors are still orthogonal to each other, then basically the, the pattern matrix and the structure matrix are exactly the same. And that's the reason why we only have a single uh, matrix that's given right here. So here we have our Verimax rotated loadings associated with each of the items. As I said before, um, the items are um, basically loading in this, you know, uh, meeting the, the same loading criteria on the same factors as we had before. It's just that one uh, item appeared to fall just, just a little bit below uh, the 0 0.30 threshold uh, that we had talked about. I will go ahead and say that had I adopted a more uh, rigorous standard, uh, a minimum loading criteria of 0.4, what we would have seen in this particular case, you would still had with factor one, you would have had uh, one, two, three items uh, right there, four, five items, uh, six, seven items that would, uh, and eight items that would have met the minimum loading criteria, but this item would not have been included on that factor. Uh, if for the omniscient authority factor right here, 
uh, basically all three of them would have met the minimum loading criteria. But then with factor three, you would have seen that these two items would have met the loading criteria, but then the remainder would not have, uh, in which case we would have had a factor with two items um, defining that factor. Uh, um, and so in that particular case, then uh, that would suggest, remember that basically we need to have at least three indicators that meet our loading criteria on that factor. So in that particular case, that would uh, suggest then that factor three could be uh, kind of a problematic factor. And we might need to uh, consider either removing the items or consider maybe re, uh, refactoring, maybe even suggesting a two-factor solution. So, uh, you know, that's just kind of the nature of factor analysis. There are a lot of decisions that, uh, that can be made. There are a lot of uh, decision points where people agree and disagree. Um, so this was, again, just uh, designed to kind of give you a, a, an idea about some of those decisions uh, using SPSS. So at any rate, that's going to wrap up this video presentation, and I appreciate you watching.